Hi everyone, this is Isaac Steinkamp with my weekly update on my video chess blog. And for today's game, I wanted to share my first Pittsburgh Chess League game um, where I represent the University of Pittsburgh in our rivalry against Carnegie Mellon University. And I thought that this game was interesting because while I was playing an expert, my opponent didn't really know the opening theory in the Fiend Keto King's Indian line and gave me the bishop pair really early. One of the things that I've noticed by going over games with low-rated players, but also players in that 16-1700 rating range, is that when a player deviates from opening theory, it's really easy to not capitalize on those mistakes and let the game kind of continue at kind of like this equalish kind of slow pace. But, you know, if your opponent deviates from theory, it's either a really good novelty or most of the times it's just some sort of inaccuracy, whether it's to give you a static advantage or if you get some sort of dynamic advantage. In this game, I took a, you know, a pretty simple advantage, the pair of bishops and the king's Indian, and was able to convert it into a pretty big dynamic advantage to get the win. So... You know, this was only a 20-move game, but my opponent, you know, is rated over 2,000, so I thought that this was a fairly instructive win. So here we go. My opponent's white, and we played the King's Indian defense, and he decided to go for a Fianchetto system. After the game, he told me that one of the openings that he knew best was a Catalan, so he makes some moves later that I think can be explained by that fact alone. For example, he'll play queen to c2 later, which is a very Catalan-esque kind of move. So I just played d6, bishop g2, c6. For those of you guys who saw my video on beating uh, my first 2100, or not necessarily beating my first 2100, but you know, winning out of the opening against 2100 and breaking 2000, um, that would have been back in 2014, I used the same opening here in this game as well. So. My opponent played castled, I castled, and after knight to c3, I played the move queen to a5. And at this point, I already knew I was out of my opponent's theory. He had already spent about seven minutes on the first seven moves, which is kind of atypical for someone who plays a fianchetto structure. Usually, it's the move order doesn't really matter as much when you set up this kind of fianchetto structure, and you can you can attain like the structure by playing a Catalan or just a fianchetto system. So I was really surprised that my opponent was taking as long as he was. The next move, however, took him ten minutes, and he the move that he came up with was a move that I really didn't like, and that was the move bishop to g5. Um, so before I explain why I don't like bishop to g5, let's take a look at some of the mainline moves and perhaps explain why my opponent chose this route. So one option in here is white uh, can play the move bishop to d2 with the threat of knight to d5 attacking the queen. So in these kinds of positions, I can play the move queen to h5 with the idea of bringing my bishop to h3 and eliminating my opponent's stronger bishop. This can actually be kind of an annoying position. And my opponent can also play the move e4, but after bishop g4, this opening becomes quite theoretical, and let's face it, my opponent doesn't know theory, and he probably figured, well, I probably know what I'm doing. Um, the last option is to play a move like h3, at which point black can start to look for moves like e5, and you know he's got a pretty good game. Also, bishop to e6 attacking c4 is pretty annoying. So if we go back, my opponent played bishop to g5, thinking that by eliminating my ability to play queen to h5, he would be okay, and that the trade of the dark squared bishop for the knight wasn't really too bad. So here I decided to really test my opponent, see what he really wanted to do, and I played the move h6. And, you know, this is a really testing move, because if my opponent wants to keep the pair of bishops, he can play bishop to d2, but now we have a transposition where black is one move ahead. And this h6 pawn looks like a weakness, but in actuality it can be a strength after a move like king to h7, you know, and I have a really solid king side. Bishop to h3 is coming, and my opponent's a little bit behind in development. This bishop's awkward, and you know this bishop's definitely blunted by the c6 pawn. So black is black is doing great here. So my opponent, realizing this, kind of made the only move that logically made sense, which was to take the knight. So I'm now to my opening theory, but I really like my position. I think I kind of intuitively explained my way through the rest of the game. This was a a 90 minute, 30 move sudden death one game in, in which you know I only needed about 30 minutes whereas my opponent used all but two minutes of his clock on the first 20 moves so I felt like the rest of this game was explained kind of intuitively after I played bishop takes f6 so my opponent played the move queen to c2 after about a 14 minute think and I didn't really know exactly why I played this move my best thought was that maybe if he wanted to play this move d5 he wanted to avoid lines where I could eliminate the c3 pawn and then the cash in on the center so that kind of made sense to me, but in actuality, I don't think it's in white's best interest to play d5 anyways. Also, by playing queen to c2, it's not quite clear what this queen is doing. Yes, he's protecting the e4 square, but this is a king's Indian, and now that I have the dark square advantage in this dark squared opening, I'm going to be playing for squares like d4 and on all dark squares. So here, 
I kind of thought to myself, okay, what move should I be looking at? I really need to develop my pieces because my opponent's compensation right now for me having the bishop pair is his development. Um, even though his pieces aren't doing anything, that as of right now is enough to say that the position is probably still equal. So I kind of figured, okay, with my knight, I have two options, right? I can develop to a6 and I can develop to d7. You know, a6 looks interesting because I can go to c7, but this takes a lot of time and it's not quite clear where I'm going. Whereas the move knight to d7 is really straightforward. But as you may have noticed, this has one fallback, uh, one f uh, fallback problem, which is the bishop on c8. If I look at the squares where the bishop on c8 can go, I'm really limited. But by playing knight to d7, my bishop on c8 can't move at all. So here I did a little bit of thinking and tried to figure out where I want to put my bishop. Well, my knight wants to go to d7, so my bishop doesn't want to go here. If I play a move like e6, I could actually get in a little bit of trouble because now d5 makes some intuitive sense. After taking, my opponent might be able to have lines where he takes. Now, obviously, in this line, the pawn is hanging, but he can easily set this up with a move like rook fd1. And I think my opponent's got a game, you know, obviously he has to be careful c4. But for me, this, posi this position just didn't really feel like I had a natural flow to it for black. So I looked at my other options. Well, bishop to f5 kind of seems a little bit silly because of this move e4. And the move bishop to g4, well, my opponent can do what I did to him with the move h3. So after thinking for a little bit, it really made sense to me that the only way to move this bishop was to eliminate it. So my goal is to get my bishop to h3. So I made the move, to, which to me made the most amount of sense, which was to move queen to h5. And I really liked this move because not only do I threaten bishop to h3, I want to be able to counter any like e4 ideas with the move e5. And by doing this, my queen's now on a much better square. It's on the king's side. And from a5, I would have to move it back to d8 or to c7. And it's not quite clear what the queen's doing. So... My opponent didn't play e4 after queen to h5. He instead went for 11 rook on f to d1 with the idea that after I play bishop to h3, he can play the move bishop to h1. Now, when I played bishop to h3, I knew that this was what his idea was, but at the same time, I realized that I was earning a tempo by playing this move. You see, from my side of the board, I was trying to figure out what white's best counterplay was, and I figured that white's best shot was to play a move like queen to b3 and attack on b7. So by winning this critical tempo, I could play the move knight to d7, and now if my opponent tries for queen to b3, I have a move like rook on a to b8, and I'm doing great. So my opponent got a little bit impatient, and I think made a move that really started to put an end to his game, which was the move e4. And I'm not sure exactly what he was expecting, but I don't like this move for a couple of reasons. One, it pins the knight to the rook, which, you know, it's on a light square. I might be able to use this bishop, and we'll get back to that in a second. Two, I get into some pretty classical king's Indian positions after the move e5. And three, this bishop on h1 really has no purpose now that this pawn's on e4, and this pawn's on c6, this bishop's actually out of the game. So white's best piece in this opening has now like has now no purpose. So here I thought about e5 versus bishop to g4, but I kind of realized by inserting this tempo move, my opponent has to make his position a little bit more awkward. So he played the move rook to d3. So here again, it's black to move, and I do want to be, you know, a little bit, you know, thoughtful about how I improve my position and when you have better pieces you want to get your pieces on better squares so in this case I was trying to figure out how do I control the dark squares and I really need to break the center to do that which means I have two options I have e5 and I have c5 well if I play c5 I run into the problem that my opponent can park his knight on d5 in some lines and this can actually cause me quite a headache so I really didn't want any business with this I like the move that I played which was e5 the idea being that well if my opponent plays d5 I could put my knight on c5 if my opponent plays d takes e, I can take back with the pawn and then still put my knight on e5. And if he does nothing, well, I can threaten to take on f3 and then take on d4. Or I can just keep the tension and play moves like rook e8, rook d8, and I'll be fine. So here in this position, my opponent took d takes e. I played d takes e. And then here my opponent ultimately lost the game with this move, queen to e2. Uh, while getting another protector for the knight, he really puts himself on a pin, and now almost all of his pieces really can't move. Now, in this position, I thought maybe white should try for b4, because my plan is fairly simple. I'm going to play knight to c5, knight to e6, and if I can, knight to d4, and create a pass pawn in the center. So my opponent's really limited in terms of defensive options. If my opponent had played b4, I was looking at moves like rook on f to d8, and if white tries to create a battery, I was going to play knight to f8 with the idea of going to e6 and then d4. Notice that because of my bishop on f6, I have enough protectors on d8, and I have a fairly straightforward strategy. At this point, I'm pretty sure black was winning, and this was the line that I had calculated during the game. 
But my opponent didn't play b4, which was really surprising, and played this queen e2 move, double question mark. So here, when you're in a position like this, and you have better pieces, and you want to get them on better squares, you also want to look at forcing moves. So the last couple of moves are real, relatively forcing. So I played the move knight to c5, attacking the rook. My opponent dropped back to d2, which was a mistake, because now I get this free move, bishop to g5. My opponent played rook to d6. Okay, well, what is that really doing? Not too much. So I played the move knight to e6. My threat here is to play knight to d4, and now material loss is inevitable. My opponent's at least going to have to give up the exchange. However, my opponent got greedy here and thought that he had full control over the d-file when he played the move queen to d3, getting himself out of the pin while also putting two major pieces on the d-file. Can you find the tactic that I spotted here in the game? Okay, so this one was fairly easy, so if you haven't seen it yet, pause your videos. But I played the move bishop to e7, attacking the rook. And whoops, white's rook actually doesn't really have that many squares. He has to play the move rook to d7, and then I followed it up with knight c5. I think my opponent thought that he was getting exchange out of this, but once he realized that this bishop on g4 also cuts back under the rook, and white can't play queen takes d7 after I recapture with knight, um, I think that that was enough for him to see the end. At this point, he already had two minutes left to make the final 10 moves, whereas I had something like 60 minutes or 59 minutes or something like that. I had plenty of time, and this is an easy win when you're at the full major piece. So what did we learn from this game? How did, how did I go about accumulating my small advantages to get such a dominating position? Well, my opponent really didn't know the opening, so that was really a big plus for me. But the first defining moment was when he played this move, bishop to g5. I had a similar position to like this before, where instead of playing knight to c3, my opponent played bishop to g5 here, and I tried this move knight to e4. But I think it's important to not be scared of this trade, bishop takes knight. So here after knight c3, queen a5, bishop g5, h6, I got the bishop pair. And my opponent wasn't really sure what my plan was, but it was kind of clear all along. I had to play for the dark squares. Uh, when, you, when you have control over certain diagonals and certain color squares, you really have to use those to your advantage. So here, you know, I'm attacking d4. I can put more pressure onto e5. It's not quite clear what my opponent's plan is. And he made that really clear to me with moves like queen to c2, and then just slowly waiting. And in this position, he got really impatient. Now, you know... If you look back at this game, you would look at the game and you'd say like, okay, bishop takes f6 is a mistake, but ultimately that wasn't losing. And, you know, at one point white had better development and it seemed like the position was closer to equal than it was decisive. Where did he go wrong? Well, e4 was definitely the start of his problems. In the game, I was expecting maybe a move like b4 or b3, um, but white definitely needs to play on the queen side and try to open up this diagonal. I think that this was white's only real chance. The problem for... For white, it's just still not so clear how he's going to go about attaining an advantage. Uh, I think during the game, my opponent said he was afraid of this move a5, but then after a3, I think white is okay. Um, I, I don't think that this is a balanced game just yet, but I, I do like white's chances to fight on a little bit more here. I'm probably still, at some point, going to break through with either b5, c5, or e5. Um, I'm definitely going for king side attack. If I have to, I can play bishop to g7 and then put my knight f6, g4, and work with what I have after e5. And I think I have enough attacking potential there to justify my position. So I think this would have been more of a game, but okay, my opponent decided that he wanted to play for the center where his pieces were at, but, but the problem by doing this was he made a lot of positional weaknesses, the knight here, the pawn here, and he really helped uh, He really helped me get the point here by tying himself down, making moves like queen to e2, and then the rest of it was just a matter of trapping his rook and getting the free piece. So... When your opponent deviates from your opening theory, you should really be asking yourself, why is it that this move isn't as good as a theoretical move? Don't necessarily assume that the move that they're making is a blunder, because that's you know how games are lost, but you know try to figure out why the move doesn't make sense. And if it makes sense, it makes sense. You know, maybe it's a good novelty, or it's just a line that you aren't aware of. But in this line, I, I would, I, I'm very confident in my knowledge of the King's Indian Fianchetto line, and it became quite clear to me that this move, Bishop to G5, really lacked any purpose in compensation for the trade. So, you know, always ask yourself, why is your opponent making the moves that they're making? And, you know, perhaps you can get positions like these against experts.